All right, um, it's one or two, so why don't we just get started as people come in. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're really excited that you have joined us today. Um, my name is Prayas Nupane, and I support business retention and expansion efforts for the Washington, D.C. Economic Partnership. Uh, for those of you that don't know much about our organization, our mission is to promote business opportunities throughout the district and contribute to business retention, as well as um, business attraction activities. Um, we do that in partnership with the Office of Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, and in collaboration with them, we support businesses and entrepreneurs that are looking to start and grow their business in the city um, by providing education on business development, as well as the real estate market, the business opportunities that are available in the city. Um, on behalf of the partnership uh, and our partners um, at um, Democracy at Work Institute, Washington Area Community Investment Fund, and Greater Washington Black Chamber of Commerce, I wanna welcome you today to our DC Bit Chat on mergers, acquisitions, and worker buyout for liquidity, growth, and exit. Uh, we certainly have an exciting topic ahead of us with amazing speakers. Uh, a lot of them are household names in the DC area, so we're really looking forward to that. So thank you for joining us today. We, um, we are looking forward to hearing from them, but also hearing from you guys. Some of you have already sent in um, some questions for us and a lot of the discussion today is uh, fostered around the topics that, that you had sent us. Um, before we begin, I wanted to share some housekeeping items. Um, our uh, webinar today is being recorded. Uh, we will be able to share a link of the recording um, within a week or two um, after the event. Uh, we welcome you to revisit the content yourself as well as share it with your colleagues and um, utilize the amazing information that you're able to hear. Um, for some of the other stuff for um, the Q&A portion, we will be using the Q&A. Uh, please utilize that if you have any questions that you weren't able to uh, ask during the registration process. We also have a chat window open. Feel free to utilize the chat window to share more information about your business. You can share your social media. Let us know why you decided to join us today so that we can be familiar with who you are and your business. Just a quick reminder, at Washington DC Economic Partnership, we value everyone's thought and respect diversity in opinions um, and thoughts. Um, so just, you know, as you are sharing um, some of your thoughts, be respectful um, and uh, be thoughtful of some of the language that you're using. Now, just want a brief background about our um, Summer Bit Chat series. The Summer Bit Chat series is the Washington DC Economic Partnership signature workshop series that support businesses um, by providing expert advice, resources, and practical solutions. Um, we bring together experts, uh, not only from a national level, but also local business leaders that have successfully navigated um, COVID-19 pandemic, as well as some of the other business areas to share their expertise and experience with the uh, larger DC community. Um, this is our workshop that we have done in the summer. Um, and we have one more upcoming in August 19th that will be focused on crowdfunding. Uh, the registration is open uh, for the crowdfunding uh, workshop and I'll be sharing that on the chat window. So feel free to register for the workshop. We have three amazing panelists for that particular um, workshop as well. Um, I, I wanna acknowledge uh, some of our partners without whom the event would not be possible. Uh, definitely Capital One and of Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. Uh, Capital One has been a long time partner for us as we bring this uh, uh, program to, together. So thank you Capital One for your support and the belief in providing this uh, sort of content to the DC community and the Deputy Mayor's Office for Planning and Economic Development. Uh, they have been our primary partner for over 20 years now and we work together to support the business community from startups uh, as well as established entrepreneurs that are looking to invest in our communities. Um, now I would like to just turn it over to our partners uh, for this particular workshop, um, uh, WECA for Washington Area Community Investment Fund. Um, for a quick welcome, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen. Thank you, Jen, for partnering with us on this. Uh, we appreciate all the, the work that you guys do to support small businesses in DC and um, really appreciative of this particular partnership. So over to you, Jen. Thank you, Price, and we're really happy to help organize this event um, with you all. My name 
Jennifer Bryant, and I'm the program manager for community wealth building initiatives at the Washington Area Community Investment Fund, one of the DC area's leading community development financial institutions focused on small business development. WAKEF has invested over $9 million um, over the last several years in the DC region. And I lead WAKEF's DC Employee Ownership Initiative, which is focused on preserving legacy businesses and creating new pathways to entrepreneurship. Our program provides technical assistance and access to capital for business owners interested in converting their business to employee ownership, which is one of the exit strategies, uh, exit and growth strategies that we'll be discussing on the webinar today. So if that's something that you're interested in exploring further, please feel free to reach out to me uh, my email address is jbryant at wakegift.org, and we'll also send that out in the follow-up email. I also wanted to mention that Wakegift's Employee Ownership Initiative is going to be doing a four-part cooperative business webinar series beginning on September 23rd. The first webinar will be led by the George Washington University um, Community Small Business and Community Economic Development Law Clinic. Um, Professor Susan Jones, and she'll be doing a presentation on entity formation and how to actually start a cooperative business in the DC area. So if you're interested in that, it's at September 23rd at 2 p.m. and we'll send out the registration link in the follow-up email. And again, thank you, Price, for the opportunity to help plan this event. Um, thank you, Jen, and that certainly sounds like an exciting workshop, so looking forward to that. Uh, just wanted to add one more thing. So closed captioning is also available for today's workshop. So if you'd like to take advantage of that, um, you can click on subtitles, which is next to your Q&A. And that should, you should be able to um, see the subtitles underneath. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, Phil Reeves from Greater Washington Black Chamber of Commerce. Phil, first time I think we're partnering on a major event. So really looking forward to that and I'm super excited for all the work that you guys are doing in DC. So turning it over to you. Absolutely, and thank you so much for the partnership. I think um, on behalf of the entire chamber, welcome everybody to, to this webinar and prize. Thank you and the, the partnership um, for having us and we look forward to continuing to collaborate uh, going forward. For those that don't know, uh, the Greater Washington Black Chamber of Commerce, we are the leading voice for black businesses in DC. Um, and really our goal is to help small businesses grow. And so our number one objective is to identify opportunities, identify resources, identify uh, mentorship and just be a resource for the community um, and so i'd invite folks to join us uh, to join our webinar series that we have going on you can learn more about us at gwbcc.org um, thank you so much and looking forward to today's conversation all right um phil um so now to um the exciting part of our event um to our panelists um uh, Thank you all for joining joining us today. We have uh, exciting panelists who have joined us. So with that, let me introduce our moderator um, for today, Todd Leverett. Um, we call him our MVP, our Tom Brady. Um, we, we, we joked about that a little bit. Uh, so Todd um, is, is the co-principal of Apis and Heritage Capital Partners and a program manager for Legacy Business Initiative at Democracy at Work Institute. Um, DAWI is a national 501c3 that strives um, to utilize employee ownership as a means to preserve and build wealth in minority communities. Uh, Todd has dedicated his life to bringing the tools and best practices of big businesses to um, middle market and, and small businesses. After having worked in finance for a large Wall Street bank, Todd, Todd began his career as an independent business consultant focused on bringing providing value-added financial and operational engineering for SMEs in Detroit, Michigan. Todd received his JD and his MBA from Columbia University in New York City and is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Morehouse College. So Todd, I'm really excited that you are moderating the panel. Um, your uh, moderation is always dynamic and exciting, so we're looking forward to that. And thank you so much for being uh, on this panel today. Turning it over to you. Chris, thank you so much, and thank you to W. WDCEP um, partners and the organizing committee really appreciate the opportunity to moderate um, this really esteemed panel of business leaders on the line today. And I'll introduce them all shortly. Again, as the was saying, my name is Todd Leverett. Um, I work at the Democracy at Work Institute and Apes and Heritage Capital Partners. I mean, your intro was, was warm, it was wonderful. One more thing that I added, you know, currently in my role at Dowie and at Apes and Heritage, um, uh, along with my partner, co-principal Phil Reeves, 
We help founders of small and medium-sized enterprises profitably and responsibly exit their businesses while preserving their legacy and protecting their workforces. And we look to help workers, specifically workers of color, to capture entrepreneurial wealth building opportunities using employee ownership, and which is part of our conversation today. Really excited to say. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us on this series. And again, we're talking about M&A and worker buyouts for liquidity, growth, and exit. Um, what we really want to accomplish um, over the remaining time that we have is to really give you an inside look into some of the options that many small and medium-sized business owners either think aren't available to them and are only available to large multinational firms, particularly in the world of M&A, or that uh, small business owners are not aware of altogether, particularly looking at the world of employee buyouts. Um, so we hope today to demystify and shine a light on how these really powerful tools of M&A and employee buyouts can be used and have been used by members of our panel today to grow and expand uh, small and medium sized businesses, um, to exit your business and move into retirement or your next venture, and to specifically as it relates to ESOPs um, and employee ownership, to get access to liquidity and, and diversify, diversify your assets as a business owner, while also incentivizing and partnering with your workforce to grow your business. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our amazing panel um, and then jump into the Q&A. So first off, we have on the line Ms. Gina Schaefer. Uh, Gina is co-founder and CEO of 13 Ace Hardware Stores located in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Maryland, and Alexandria, Virginia. Um, Gina is a passionate entrepreneur who grew her company from one to 12 stores in a 14-year period, and with her husband leads a multi-million dollar small business that employs more than 300 people. Uh, Gina has tirelessly focused on the return to Main Street movement in her own city here in Washington, D.C., and serves on the board of directors at CCA Global Partners, um, is a member of the ACE Center for Excellence, and she also serves on the nonprofit board at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Gina, thank you so much for joining us on the line today. Um, next, we have Mr. Pedro Alfonso, who is co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Dynamic Concepts, Inc., an infrastructure construction company located in Washington, D.C., Prior to starting DCI in 1979, Mr. Alfonso gained much of his business expertise and technical knowledge from his work at the IBM Corporation's Federal Systems Division and the General Electric Company's Information Systems Business Division. A graduate of Howard University School of Business, Mr. Alfonso is active in various organizations, including, and I'll just name a few, uh, currently serving as Vice Chair of the Board of the DC Public Access Corporation. Um, he's a member of the DC Public Service Commission's Advisory Council on utility supplier and workforce diversity. He's on the board of the DC Hispanic Contractors Association. He's former chairman of the National Small Business Association um, and the DC, as well as the DC Chamber of Commerce and the DC Private Industry Council. Um, and he currently serves on the board of the Statehood Research DC Committee. Um, note, Mr. Alfonso has also served as a presidential appointee to the White House Conference on Small Business. Um, last but not least on the line, we have Mr. Steve Storkin, who's the current executive director for the Employee Ownership Expansion ne Network um, and uh, a longtime partner of our team over the Democracy at Work Institute and Apes Heritage. Storkin brings uh, 25 years of experience in the employee ownership community. Prior to joining the Employee Ownership Expansion Network, he was director of ESOP Administration Services for Alaris Retirement Solutions. Steve has also spent over 15 years in volunteer duties for the uh, Minnesota Dakota's chapter of the ESOP Association, including being past president as well as vice president of the chapter's government relations committee. Um, so I'm sure if we were all in the, in the room together, there would be a round of applause for our, for our amazing panel here today. So I'll give you a second to applaud, applaud wherever you're at. Um, and we'll go ahead and jump in. So, so note that these, these bios I just gave were very, very abridged. I could spend all day talking about the, the personal and business accomplishments that our panel has achieved, but I wanna give you a chance to hear their voices and I want them to share with you a bit about their connections with the M&A and the worker buyout world. Um, so what I'm gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and start with Gina and Pedro, and then I'll have a slightly different question for Steve. Uh, but Gina and Pedro, and let's start with Gina. Um, briefly, tell us when and how did you come to first start or acquire your current business and how have you used the tools of merger and or acquisition uh, within your business? Um, sure, so my business was founded in 2003 and I purchased my first location in 2000 and 
15, I believe. So it was a ways down the road. So I had built most of the locations that we have from scratch. ACE is a co-op, a lot of people don't know that, but I waited till 2015. There was a local merge, uh, there was a local buyout opportunity and I wanted to grow, that happened to be in Alexandria. And so that's when I had my first uh, purchase and we've had three more since then, so a total of four. Whoops, Todd, you went to mute. Thank you, Gina. Out of all the years, out of all the locations you've acquired, uh, you you now have, I believe the number is thirteen. How many of those were through through acquisition of an existing of an existing location? Four. So we um, we've purchased four of them, and the rest we built from scratch. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Pedro, same question to you. Um, when and how did you first come to start or acquire your current business? And how have you used merger and or acquisition um, as a strategy within your business? Well, uh, thank you, Todd. Actually, uh, we started our business in 1979. So we've been in business now 41 years, uh, 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 mostly organic growth. Uh, our first uh, uh, foray into uh, acquisition was in 2001 actually small acquisition uh, in 2001 it was to to try to go, grow the business in a particular area that uh, we had a, a small focus and that was in mass mailing uh, we had major contracts with the federal government and we were trying to expand that uh, back then 2001 20 years ago I, I would say Gina was probably saying my, my goodness I was in elementary school uh, the uh, so that was probably, uh, uh, and we'll talk about it a little bit further later, but that was probably uh, a lesson learned of all the things not to do in terms of uh, acquisition. Uh, to, uh, we, since then, we had a second acquisition, probably about uh, four years ago, five years ago now, and it was uh, a much more of a major uh, uh, purchase. Uh, it, it, it positioned us in, uh, in a market that we felt would be the uh, uh, future of the business uh, in terms of uh, construction infrastructure. Uh, it gave us the, uh, a baseline to uh, get into some other areas. So two different acquisitions with two different uh, levels of impact on the business. Uh, we now run, we have about 320 employees, four locations, and uh, uh, on, on a pretty good growth pattern. Wonderful, excellent, excellent. Um, and now we'll hop over and, and everybody, I know everybody has so many questions. We're gonna get into some more of the details behind these transactions shortly. We're just giving a, a high level overview right now. Um, so let me hop over to Steve. Steve, tell us more about your career working with um, ESOPs and worker buyouts. So, you know, in what capacity did you work? How many have you worked on? What industries? And uh, were you working with owners or workforces? So just give us a, a bit, bit more detail in your background. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, I uh, started uh, my career at a law firm as a legal assistant. It was a benefits law firm, and uh, we were doing retirement plans. At that point, it was uh, in 1993. It was profit sharing plans, annually valued, doing some statements and sending out some great statements to some people. And we've gone, you know, all the way to now where we're 401k daily valued and uh, we found out about ESOPs in 1995, and I've been hooked ever since. Uh, employee ownership is a passion of mine. So for the first 25 years of my career, I spent uh, in the pri private sector counseling with business owners on what employee ownership was, how it worked, how to make the transition. And then once uh, we did find a business owner who was interested in it, we helped them uh, implement that plan. And then my, my division of the business then took it forward and worked with the workforce going forward. So we were the ones who were handing out statements and telling them about their benefits, talking about how these plans worked, uh, really staying involved uh, on, on employee ownership and, and giving them the ideas on how it worked. Um, also, every industry you can think of from manufacturing, uh, architects and engineers, construction, government contractors. Uh, I think employee ownership works in almost every business maybe a little bit less in the professional services business, just because of some of the regu regulatory restrictions. You don't see a lot of CPA firms or law firms, um, you know, in employee owned in the peer sense where it's broad based ownership. Um, but that's a little bit of my background. And, and I'm sure when we get into the questions, you'll hear a lot more about what we're doing. Uh, right now, I guess, 
probably should say I am their executive director. I jumped from the private sector to the nonprofit sector. I'm the executive director of the Employee Ownership Expansion Network. And our single mission is to expand employee ownership across the United States by opening state centers for employee ownership in states that have uh, pockets of service providers and a lot of interest in employee ownership. Uh, started about 18 months ago and we've opened five new state centers in those 18 months and we have uh, three of them coming right behind. So we're hoping to have eight state centers here by the end of the year. So I'm appreciative to be here, Todd. Thank you. Thanks to all the hosts. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on the line, Steve. Really, really appreciate that. Um, all right, so we're gonna hop into some, uh, we got a kind of high level overview. We know where our panelists stand as far as their history with M&A and employee buyouts. So we're gonna hop into some more detailed questions. The first question I wanna answer, I wanna ask, excuse me, and again, we're going to start with uh, Gina and Pedro. And Pedro, I'll give you an opportunity to, to start us off. Is around um, is around culture. I've I've often heard that the cultural part of an M&A transaction is is um, is sometimes the hardest part. Is what happens after all the papers get signed and the transaction is over, and now you're here with with two workforces that that need to become one can be you know can make or break a make or break a transaction. So can can both of you speak briefly, uh, Pedro and Gino? Uh, to the ease or the difficulty that you've had in joining two different cult corporate cultures um, or more into one. Do you want the honest answer? Pedro, go ahead and start us off, and then we'll. <laughs> okay. we, 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 want the, we want the honest answer, yes. Yeah. Uh, major issue, uh, certainly for us. Uh, uh, let's talk about the, the second acquisition that we did. We, we bought a firm out of uh, uh, Virginia that was doing a lot in infrastructure, in, in, in gas pipeline installation, uh, that that was enterprise uh, type of acquisition where it included uh, uh, people, equipment, and contracts. Uh, and the people were s substantial. There were over 100 people on that particular operation. Uh, we were only about 200 at the time, so it was a third of the business or a third of the size. And uh, uh, you know, I don't want to overemphasize culture chalk, but that's what it was for us. It's, uh, it turned out that th those hundred people, uh, uh, there was uh, a, a huge amount of nepotism because they were, they were all related. There were uh, father and sons and cousins and uncles and, and relations. And uh, it, it, in, in, in some way that could be good because of the cohesiveness but when you try to make management changes and when it comes to discipline and uh, 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 it wasn't being uh, applied evenly. And, and so there was a cultural difference between how we operate and trying to get our hands around that operation. And it was, it was a, a substantial, it, it delayed uh, uh, integrating that operation to how we operate uh, uh, substantially. What was good about it is that there was a substantial amount of expertise and skills that you could not acquire uh, uh, without developing over a decade. So we acquired excellent expertise, but we had to break down uh, and, 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 and uh, apply a different culture uh, for productivity and efficiency reasons. Um, I, wrote, I wrote down actually four, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read them just quick sort of blurbs of um, tidbits that I know now that I didn't know the first time. One, over communicate. So you can never communicate enough with the upcoming staff and your current staff. Plan for difficulty. Uh, my first acquisition, which had some extenuating circumstances, um, I went in very naively. I expected everyone to love me, what's not to love. Um, the, the company's great, the team is great. Um, and that doesn't always happen. And so plan for difficulty. Third was know the players, but formulate your own opinions. So I've realized in all four transactions, the previous owners wanted to tell me about every single employee, all the nitty gritty, their personality traits, good and bad. Um, and there are already enough assumptions going into a transaction like this, but when you think you know all of the players um, and you're bouncing them against someone else's personality, uh, it, it could lead to false beliefs. And so um, I would say I have been um, appreciative of some of the tidbits that I have been given prior to the acquisition finishing, 
but I also have gotten much smarter about formulating my own opinions. One great example is a manager that we did not expect to last more than a month. Uh, five years later, he's still there, and I think that the store runs very well because of him, but if I had just listened to the previous owner or maybe gone on my first instinct, that might not have happened. Um, and then the fourth one that I wrote down was manage your PR. So one of the things that I've also realized is you have your own staff personalities, um, the new staff's personalities, and in some cases you have the community's personalities. So um, some of you might know that I purchased Fragers on Capitol Hill. Fragers turns 100 years old this year, which is amazing. That is a, a brand to you know, hold and steward and, and figure out how you can still grow it. Uh, but it was long entrenched in that community and the community had a lot of opinions about the new owners um, and some of the new staff and some of the ways that previous staff left um, on their own accord, but it never looks that way from the outside, right? So those, those were probably my, my four cultural um, highlights. Each one of the acquisitions for us was different. And I would say that, I don't know if this is good or bad, the last two um, were finalized at the end of January. So we bought two locations, Silver Spring and Petworth, and then the world fell apart. And I haven't been back to those stores since. Now, obviously we Zoom and communicate, but the mergers of those cultures and teams has been very different. Excellent, excellent. Thank, thank you so much. Um, Steve, a slightly different question for you. Um, employee buyouts are, are a different flavor, a different kind of M&A transaction in that the acquirer already works at the firm. <laughs> so it doesn't seem like the traditional kind of two corporate cultures issue really applies. Um, however, it does seem, and it's true that there could be big changes that happen inside of a newly employee owned firm. Can you talk a little bit about what does or what doesn't change pre and post employee buyout? And, you know, feel free to touch on, you know, governance, workforce management, but you know, what, what does or doesn't change or can or, or, or can't change? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I think the most successful employee-owned companies um, going forward that change what changes post uh, sale or conversion to employee ownership, not a lot changes. Um, you know, most successful employee-owned companies really were act acting as employee-owned companies before the conversion, before the uh, the employees uh, were part of the buyout, whether it be through an ESOP or worker co-op or any other form of profit sharing. Um, it's just now I think what happens on, in the best of them is that they now feel like they have a voice in the system. They have an equity stake at the company where they work. Uh, they have some say in, in some decisions that are made, uh, especially in the worker co-op world with the one share, one vote idea. Uh, a lot of different things change. You know, some of these businesses uh, are second or third generation businesses. And while they had that family feel and there was some collaboration at the end of the day, it was still, um, the man or woman whose family started the business that was actually making all the decisions and the board of directors may have been a husband and wife team and maybe one of the management team. But now you've got some independent directors on the board who are helping to drive that business. Uh, that business owner may or may not still be involved, you know, in an ESOP uh, or in the ESOP world, you know, an owner can sell 20%, 30% stay on the business, uh, stay continuing to manage the business and, and be chairman of the board. But the trustee of that ESOP is going to require them to have some independent outside voices. And so in the long run, there's a lot that can change, but many of them don't change because they were already there at the, in the first place. Um, but I think the single thing that you should remember and know about employee about it, buyout is that the employees, the businesses now run uh, for the benefit of the, the employees and their beneficiaries and, and what's best for the business and the employees uh, at that point. So I, I think that's the major thing that changes uh, from a post-sale transaction or post-sale transaction uh, an employee-owned company. Um, you know, the other thing that changes, I think, if you think about communities, uh, an employee buyout um, definitely retains the jobs in those communities. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with mergers and acquisitions. Uh, our, you know, Gina and Pedro are doing great jobs, and I'm sure they kept as many employees as they could. Uh, in Gina's case, I know more about your business than Pedro, but, you know, Gina, you said something very important. You kept the brand on Capitol Hill. That's very important. You probably kept as many employees as you could. I mean, that doesn't always happen in a merger and acquisition. In fact, let's be frank, it rarely happens. And so from an employee ownership standpoint, nothing changes. We don't change the business model on day one. Everything stays the same uh, and jobs stay in the community. Those businesses stay in the communities in which they were born. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, 
uh, Gina and Pedro for talking about culture. And I think that's a, that's a good lead in when, um, as my, my partner Phil often says, and is indicated by your answers, um, all business in some way or another is personal, right? You're going to be dealing with some person or another, whether it's the person you're, you're acquiring, emerging the company with, whether it's the team coming on, whether it's your own workers and employees serving a, a new role within, within the workforce, um, you're going to have to deal with, with, with people. And that can be the, the toughest part, but also the most rewarding part um, of, of any M&A or employee buyout transaction. So really appreciate those answers. Um, but want to take a step back, you know, with the difficulty that, that may come with an M&A transaction, I think, I think all, or a, a worker buyout, I think all of you touched on this. We want to get a sense of, of the why. The, the motivation, what was the underlying reason, and, and again, starting with Gina and Pedro, what was the, the core underlying reason for your choice to undertake a M&A transaction with your business? Um, what was the outcome and was your vision fulfilled? And, and I think you both touched on this to some degree, but if you could really zero in on what you saw within your business and what you saw within the business that you were um, acquiring or merging with that, that really made you say, this is going to be this is going to be worthwhile, and was that was that original vision and dream uh, ultimately fulfilled? So, uh, Pedro, Gina, whichever one of you wants to go ahead and, and start first. Sure. As I mentioned, thanks, Sean. As, as I mentioned earlier, we we've had two acquisitions, and uh, the first one was was a lesson learned. It was more of an asset purchase, asset uh, of, of equipment, and and, mm -hmm. and 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 getting into. Uh, several uh, uh, commercial contracts that we were on the federal side, it was able to expand a business line that we were in. Uh, uh, timing is everything in acquisitions. Uh, timing couldn't have been worse. Yeah. Uh, uh, right after we made the purchase, which was, uh, uh, that purchase was less than a million dollars. So it was uh, short of that, but we were able to expand our equipment. We thought we would position ourselves in in a very large market uh, that 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 was blooming at the time. This is this is about 2000. Uh, uh, right after that, we actually lost the uh, federal contract that we were on at the Department of Education, and then, as I mentioned, timing. And right after that, the anthrax scare came out that they stopped all mailings. And so timing is important in business in general. But as you expect uh, uh, acquisition to help out that, that, but we learned a lot in terms of, uh, uh, I learned that I did not know how to do good due diligence and that was important. On the second go round was the uh, uh, infrastructure construction firm that, that we purchased, very strategic on what we want to do moving into the future. It was uh, 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 getting into very, large scale equipment in terms of excavators and, and backhoes, large trucks, tractor trailers. This was a major acquisition. Uh, uh, they had a run rate of, of, of about uh, close to 20 million, 100 employees. This, this for us, uh, this was a, a, a major step. And uh, we saw that as an opportunity, but, but again, uh, uh, lesson learned on a lot of each time you do a transaction in a deal you learn a little bit more uh, fortunate for gina she's done an, a, a a lot of them so she a building block in terms of knowledge and sometimes you have you, you know you lose a lot of money in getting that phd on acquisitions and uh we learned some things that we need to, to do uh it it was key to our business and uh, now we've integrated that whole operation to uh, working with other utilities, uh, major projects. We've turned, we've turned it into a synergism of, of construction services that is working on behalf. It took, took a couple of years. That was not a six month turnaround. I think you probably gave me some credit that I don't deserve. <laughs> We, we always said, I've always said I had to keep growing and keep opening new stores because every time I opened a new one, I would screw something up. And so I wanted to do it again and get it right. But that meant that I would screw something else up. And it's this terrible, like ongoing, uh, ongoing issue. I would say the, the four acquisitions, well, one, we had an appetite for growth. 
in, um, I guess in all four cases, we've wanted to grow. We've wanted to grow for a couple different reasons. I have young leaders that I want to be able to grow uh, with us and I can't give them a bigger leadership role unless they have an, you know, another location to, to take over for us or you know, some growth opportunities or more revenue to pay more. So those are certainly motivators. Um, we've become at this point the largest player in the market. So for all four acquisitions, the owners, the previous owners came to us and said, I'm ready to retire um, or close. Would you be willing to buy our business? And so I would say, I, I have to accurately say, I was not actively looking for an acquisition, but there aren't that many other hardware stores, independent hardware stores in the market. So it wasn't like, you know, there's dozens of owners out there who I'm waiting for them to retire. There were very few. And the four that we've purchased from uh, so far came to us when they were ready to retire because they knew that we were the, what, the growing entity in the market. So um, that's why we ended up um, purchasing the stores that we did. Did it turn out the way we wanted? Um, I think the two that we acquired in January are still too new to say. Uh, COVID, because we have been considered an essential business, has obviously made the numbers this year look very good. So the short answer is yes. All four of them have turned out the way we wanted. Uh, the first two, uh, the first one was Old Town Alexandria. We wanted to expand into a new market and we like to think of ourselves as truly urban, but Old Town feels urban in a lot of ways. And so it made sense when that owner came to us. That store is, is great. Um, it's not going to win any awards for the highest revenue, but it's a, it's a nice store and a beautiful community and the neighbors really appreciate that we're there. So I think all things considered, um, yes, I think it's, it's definitely turned out the way we've wanted and um, we don't expect that to change. And I think we're less scared now, despite the fact we still keep making these mistakes, we're less scared to try it again. Excellent, excellent. I want to dig in, Steve, before we jump over to, to your part of the question, I want to dig in a little bit more on some points that Pedro and Gina brought up. Um, you know, COVID is, it, it's here right now. <laughs> and it's for, it's here for the, for the, the near medium and hopefully not the, not the, the distant future. Um, but Pedro, you talked about timing being, you know, oh, so important. Gina, um, you touched on some of the motivations of um, the people who sold sold their businesses to you or you acquired the businesses uh, from. Um, I know we may have some folks on the line right now who in this time of COVID are thinking similar to you all have thought before, like this is an opportunity to expand. This is an opportunity to grow my business. But we may have some other folks on the line who are thinking, hey, I don't, I don't want to go through, I don't want to weather the next, you know, three, five, seven years of, you know, whatever lies ahead, I've done a good job, I'm looking, you know, I'm kind of looking for that next stage in the life. And, and one of the topics we want to talk about is, is exit. So, Gina, you talked about some of the exit um, um, reasons by, from the folks you, you purchased from. Pedro, as much as you're able to share, can you talk a little bit about um, the motivations for the, the owners who, who sold to you, if, if you're, as much as you're able to share? Yeah. Uh, you're on mute, Pedro. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Todd. What, what I, I would say, it, acquisitions is a, is, a, is a very strange game. First of all, I, I, I would say whether you're selling or buying, I would say, you know, certainly buyer has to beware. It, it is not always uh, common interest in if you're buying or selling. Uh, there's two parties that want to come out with the best deal possible, and that's money in their pocket. So you have to be careful on, on uh, time is important, when you're going to sell. Uh, think about all of those restaurant tours and hospitality uh, industry people who, who have come at the end of their life uh, on a business uh, in 2019 and said, you know, I had a good run. In 2020, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cash out and retire. And what happened to their dreams? So timing becomes very important. Uh, as you, as you purchase, and those who want to exit, you got you got to understand on the acquisition. Everybody does not uh, is not selling because they're making a ton of money, and now they want to give away this money because they like you, and and it's it's a reason they're uh, they're selling. It's not doing as well as they 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 wanted to. It is too hard. The markets change, and now they 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 they, they, they don't want to go through the struggle. So very. 
it's hard to time a market, even on an exit, when you're totally on top, it's a little bit of luck and the timing is important. So even with myself, at some point in time, there, there is an ex exit strategy, uh, but when is enough enough? You know, you're always looking for, if I do it now, I got this other deal that's about to hit that's going to double my business. And that, but what if it doesn't happen? It could, it couldn't. And, and so you have to time what's, what's important for you at the time that you, 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 you're trying to do your exit strategy. And so I, I think it's important that uh, you look at the factors, whether you're buying or selling. I would say, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander is not always true in acquisition. Because what's good for you may not be good for the others. Uh, and everybody's trying to position themselves for a win. And if you can both win, great, but somebody's going to leave something on the table and you're hoping it's not you. That's that, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, such poignant answers from, from both of you. Um, Steve, on the hopping over to the employee ownership side, and it's going to connect, um, especially when, uh, as Pedro was referencing, kind of talking about, um, you know, liquidity and timing. Steve, if you can talk a little bit about um, why do owners and or companies choose to do employee buyouts or uh, conversions to employee ownership? Um, and if you can talk a little bit about, you know, motivations of owners, and if you can touch on the liquidity piece, uh, two, um, motivations for management at firms um, and workforces and or others in, in the process. So motivations for employee buyout. Yeah, from a, from a selling shareholder standpoint and employee buyout, um, you know, I think they all have different motivations for why they're selling their company. And, and I think in, in working with most uh, owners of businesses, they go through, uh, they, they set out those motivations on paper. Uh, we talk with them about what each one of them means and how employee ownership uh, fits into that. And many times at the end of the day, when it comes down to whether or not they're going to sell their business to a third party, say a strategic buyer or a financial buyer, um, or you know, make an employee ownership conversion, many times uh, it really comes down to a couple things on why they do an employee buyout. And a lot of them, I call it the leave a legacy uh, concept. They they really, I can tell you about a couple I met where, where the uh, husband and wife had run this business for a really long time in a small Wisconsin city. Uh, and the owner of the business said to me, I can't imagine staying in this community and driving by that plant every day and knowing that things had changed, whether the plant was closed, whether people had been laid off, uh, they all helped us get to where we are and we want to leave that legacy. They can change the name. It's not going to be Johnson and you know, Johnson Manufacturing anymore. That's fine. But I want to be able to see people in the grocery store and know that we did the best we could and at the same time took care of ourselves. So a lot of times employee ownership is done for that reason, but not always. You know, employee ownership does have a tax deferral component to it. Owners can get a tax deferral on the sale of their business, whether it's to an ESOP or to a worker co-op in some times, some places. Um, and that tax benefit is, is sometimes very important to them. There's a, there's a lot of money that's taken off the table when you have to pay your tax bill. So I, I think that's one of the other motivations. And lastly, uh, I know a motivation for an owner would be that, that stay involved and diversification, sell in tranches kind of things. I, I don't know of any other way to sell a business or exit a business where you can do it over a two, three, five, 10 year period. Uh, one of the board of directors on a, uh, EOX uh, has just sold his business in Pennsylvania for the third time, uh, third tranche of stock, and it was the best thing he could have ever done, he said. Uh, he let people understand how employee ownership worked. He was there to help communicate it rather than sell it all at once, leave the business and, and hope for the best. Uh, he did it in, in, in waves. And so uh, lots of different motivations for owners on why they would sell to the company. Management, I think, really loves an employee buyout because it doesn't involve any of their own, any of their own cash. It involves all the sweat equity and everything they put into this business, whether they've been there for one year or 25 years. Uh, everything that they've given back to the business is taken into consideration by that owner uh, by doing the employee conversion. Not a lot changes uh, after the business um, is sold to an employee ownership. Uh, you know, you have an independent board of directors, as I said, but that management team still runs the business. And in fact, they run it even more. Uh, that owner is trying to get out, whether they sold and left or whether they sold and stuck around. Uh, that management team does have to become more involved. It's almost like they're given the keys to a car that they've been renting or, you know, driving for the boss for a while. He, 
he or she hands over those keys and says, I'm here to help, but you know, it's, it's your ship to run or your car to drive. So I think whether it's a motivation for management or not, it's certainly a byproduct, a very good byproduct for the management. And then lastly, on the workforce, uh, as you can you know, probably tell, I'm passionate for this mainly because of the voice that employee, on, employee owners get at work. Um, they usually come from really good companies, sometimes not, but most of the time they've already have a little bit of a voice. Um, but this really gives them a voice at work, really makes them feel like they own a piece of the rock, that they can make changes. Uh, one of the stories that I love to tell is there was a janitor in one of the employee-owned companies that I knew about who came to the CEO one morning and said, uh, boss, do we have to leave the lights on in the robot room? I clean that thing every night and the lights are always on. Uh, do you mind if I shut the lights off? Because I think we're wasting a lot of money that could be put back into profit sharing or put back into the business. And the boss, the CEO was just amazed that somebody would say that and why the janitor hadn't said it over his 30 year career until he became an employee owner. So lots of uh, byproducts, uh, good byproducts for employee ownership, ownership and motivation for those employees to do better uh, in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. So we've got questions rolling in from the audience. So I think I'll, um, if you all don't mind, hop off um, my prepared questions and, and go to a couple of the, the um, participants' questions or the, the attendees' questions. Um, and, and the first is this, and feel free to, if you share or not share, um, who can help a small business owner who is de retiring decide whether it is feasible to merge, sell, or convert to worker ownership? Are there organizations or individuals out there that help with this? And this is open to, to all of our panelists. Uh, quickly, I, I would just say it, in, in a buy or sell, I, I would encourage anyone to make sure they, uh, uh, they get a legal uh, consultation on how to structure the deal. Where you think you run a business all your life, you know the business, you know everything, you don't know all the T's and C's associated with uh, the, you know, you need to make sure that, for instance, uh, the LOI is structured in such a way that it sets the pay, the, 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 a letter of intent going into a purchase agreement that you are structured that in such a way that you're, it's to your advantage and you don't know all the intricacies uh, from a tax structure, equity position, how the, the question that you will have. So that consultation and from a legal end would be very helpful. And to find out what the market is, is like out there, it's, uh, you know, uh, if you're trying to exit, uh, what's the best way to do it? It all depends on who comes to the table. That's what I was saying, uh, Gina. Well, there's also, I know a couple of the owners that we worked with worked with business valuation firms um, that helped the, the owners um, legitimately value, you know, we all think our businesses are worth more than they probably are in a lot of cases, right? But legitimately went through the numbers and gave them a realistic valuation. Um, and the fees for companies like that vary, but um, I know that there are some very credible ones out there. So I would say in addition to, and I totally agree, Pedro, that you need to find good attorneys. Um, find somebody who's going to give you a fair valuation of your business and work with you through that process. Todd, I would, I would just add, you know, I, coming from the private sector, when someone asked that question, I had some resources in my back pocket that I worked with that I would refer them to. And I, and I really never knew about places like WCEP, uh, Black Chamber of Commerce, uh, and EOX. I really, I really never understood coming from the private sector. And business owners often don't understand what a nonprofit does. There's a lot of different ideas when you come from the private sector on what profit and what nonprofit centers do. And so centers like the ones that we're running, the state centers for employee ownership across the country, uh, you can find them on eoxnetwork.org. Uh, and then all of the other you know, connections that are here to, through this webinar. What's the great part about all of these organizations, like I said, that I never understood, is they, have the re they are connecting the resources. They have vetted and are working with these types of, like Pedro and Gina said, they know of the best attorneys. They see them all the time. They know which ones are doing great jobs in the ESOP world, which ones are doing in the worker co-op. They know which valuation firms or even business, uh, uh, business coaches. Uh, I met one yesterday that, uh, through one of these private nonprofits that introduced me to a, a gentleman who's doing amazing things in coaching businesses on how to increase the value of their company even before they go to market. 
Um, so I think taking advantage of some of these nuts, you know, I don't do a plug for me. I didn't mean to do that, but it's, it's the, it's the nonprofit parts of the country that I think are misunderstood as that unbiased, not selling you anything, but can connect you to some amazing resources. And I would very much encourage uh, people to look at that. And, and I know Todd, uh, last time we did a webinar, there was, there was even some dollars. You talk, Gina talks about valuation. I know there's some dollars out there sometimes where you can actually have uh, other people pay for that valuation for you too. So that, that's what I would say. Excellent, excellent. Thank you all. And I'd like to re reiterate, if it's something you're thinking about, WDCEP, uh, Greater Washington Black Chamber of Commerce, WACUF, DOWIE, Agents and Heritage, EOX, um, you have a lot of resources on, on the line right now, nonprofit organizations and CDFIs on the line who are here specifically to help um, small and medium-sized enterprises connect up to the folks that they, they need to connect up to. So, yeah, please, please, please utilize us. Um, as, as much as as much as you can. Um, let me see. So a question, another question that came in that is also a question on my list as we run in close to time. So so please be be as concise as you can. Um, is the question on everybody's mind, which is um, about capital. <laughs> so as much as you're willing to share, um, Pedro and Gina about your specific transactions, um, and, and then we'll hop over. Steve, I'll hop over you again with a slightly different differently uh, framed question. Um, how was the transaction financed or how are these transactions financed? Um, were there outside lenders involved? What was the, the process look like? What did they, you know, what did they look at as, as much as you're able to share um, Pedro uh, and Gina? Well, and either one you can start off. Yeah. I'll, I'll let uh, Gina speak uh, for her transaction. Uh, but our, our larger transaction that we did a couple of years ago uh, it was a it was a combination of uh, of uh, debt service in terms of loan from a bank. Uh, we had uh, a certain amount of our our own uh, equity that that we put in uh, from our reserves, and mm -hmm. and stretch out a, a a payment schedule that was tied to a certain amount of performance renewal of contracts uh, that the that the operation maintained a certain level of. Of, of a revenue base that we didn't buy it and then it dropped in half. So those kind of uh, measurements triggered payments a year out and it was over two years that we had to pay uh, 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 quite a few millions of dollars uh, to uh, acquire this particular firm. So you could do it a lot of different ways. Uh, uh, in this particular instance, uh, sometime uh, 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 a seller uh, would have to take back a certain amount of equity in the deal uh, in order to make the transaction work. Now, we did not, uh, uh, our acquisition did not uh, uh, require uh, equity uh, because of, of, of full ownership within the corporation. So you could structure the deal in a lot of different ways, stretch out payments, uh, but it's hard to get into a deal without some type of upfront cash payment just to get the deal rolled. Gina, what's your, what's your... And Gina, quickly, so, so, it, so, so before Gina jumps, jumps in, Pedro, um, the, the target-based payment schedule you talked about, that was an agreement you came to with the seller of the company. So the seller wouldn't receive certain payments for the company unless certain milestones were, were hit in the following year or years, correct? That's correct. A big one, a very large one, was the uh, the innovation of the contract, the base contract that was generating a lot of the revenue was coming to an end within about nine months. So the renewal of that contract with the customer to the new entity was really the linchpin of a deal. Without that, uh, a lot of the uh, 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 ongoing revenue would not happen. So that was a big trigger. And then uh, the operation had to hit a certain amount of profitability and revenue because that's what we felt would generate uh, the funds to repay uh, uh, the loan and, and, and the buyout. So it was it's all tied in. So capital often you don't need the full amount to make the deal, but you need to have the finances in place. Uh, and, and it doesn't always, you know, you might expect a, 
a 10% return and, you know, first couple of years, it might be three, 4%. And so you have to, you, you have to build that in. Those, those synergisms aren't, don't always work out uh, accordingly. So there's a, there's a lot of ways of coming up with the capital and the money to do a deal or, or to exit uh, in that regard. It goes both ways. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if, to the extent this is helpful, but so for one, as a member of the ACE co-op, uh, we have to maintain a certain debt to equity ratio. And so um, in any of the purchases, ACE has made sure that those numbers make sense. I mean, obviously with our input from our accountant, et cetera. And then um, we have always done our financing since, well, since 2004, basically with National Cooperative Bank. Um, which was chartered in the 70s by the federal yeah. government because uh, banks would historically not loan to co-ops. And so NCB was founded um, and they have a great partnership with a lot of ACE retailers. And so they've financed all of our, our purchases and they've been, for the most part, outright asset purchases. So for us, that means inventory and fixtures and equipment. Um, and that's, they've ranged from, I think, a $350,000 purchase to a $2 million purchase, roughly, depending on the size of the store and the inventory involved. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. And Steve, if you can talk a little bit about the um, how are employee buyouts financed? Um, you touched on it a little bit before. Are workers paying for the shares? How can they afford it? Who are the lenders in this transaction? If you can touch on some of the same points that uh, Gina and Pedro did in the employee buyout situation. Sure. I think one of the biggest myths about an employee buyout is that the employees are using their own cash or in an ESOP situation, people think it's a retirement plan. That means it's coming directly from the employee's own pocket or their retirement plan. And very rarely in any employee buyout are the employees actually ponying up any cash of their own out of their bank account or their retirement plan. Now in a worker co-op, I know there is a small buy-in, but I also know that the worker co-ops uh, that are put in for the right reasons are very small buy-ins and that's for, that is for a reason so that all employees in a small business can participate. But the majority of these buyouts are done through uh, capital uh, or financing done by major banks. Um, the lending is done by a major bank at first and the part that the major bank won't take is either done then by a seller note uh, between the company and the seller where maybe they get paid out over a six, eight, ten year period. Uh, or if, uh, and or some mezzanine financing where another company comes in, maybe takes a little bit higher interest rate, but we'll put the capital in there as well. So it's not a, a true employee buyout. I love the word, but uh, it does give a myth that employees have to have the money. And in fact, that just is not true. So I know we're on time, so I won't go deep into that, but th that's kind of the basic of three ways, major lenders, uh, sellers taking a note, and then uh, some mezzanine lending or secondary lending behind that. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, it seems, uh, Prius, are we gonna, I know we're, we're getting close to time. I'll go ahead and, and pass it back to you. But before I do that, let me say panel, it's been amazing um, working with you all here today. You all shown and, and have provided some really amazing information to everybody out here today. So it's been an honor to, to, to serve with you all here today and I'll pass it back to, to Prius, thank you. Can I say one thing, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, 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 I want to thank the WDCP for the opportunity and the Black Chamber of Commerce because if I would have had this type of uh, opportunity to, to learn something uh, before I did the other deal, it would have been very helpful. So you're, you're providing some uh, good information back to uh, 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 the public. And, and Gina, I, I, I did a survey at one of your Ace Hardware uh, stores and asked them about the, the new acquisition. I have. And, and, and I have some words for you. Uh, they love it uh, and, and, and they like the new owners. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Todd and, and Pedro and Gina and Steve. You guys are just amazing. I know um, coming into this, I was really excited to hear about this, partly because I think we don't hear a whole lot of content about mergers and acquisitions and this sort of advice uh, to businesses. And uh, we're really proud to bring this content and especially proud to bring business owner that has really contributed towards the fabric of the DC community. Um, just to say, Gina, looks like you already have Pedro who is doing service for you for free. So you might not have to pay anyone for that. And you know, Ace Hardware is my hardware store. Every time I go there, 
I just come out of there with a smile on my face because everyone is so nice and kind there. Thank you. I appreciate that. For your Thank leadership you. on that. And Pedro, you, you having done business here for over 40 years, I think you pretty much symbolize what DC business owners are all about. And uh, we definitely appreciate you hiring locally as well as providing all the support you do to the local business community. And lastly, Todd and Steve, I know you guys have done a lot of work in supporting entrepreneurs. So um, thank you for the work you do uh, in doing that. And um, definitely want to thank our partners for, for this particular event with WACEF and also Greater Washington Black and Chamber of Commerce. Jen and Phil, you guys are doing amazing work in supporting businesses, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic time. So thank you for that. And thank you for partnering with us and bringing this, this content. So that concludes our big chat for today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we will be doing another big chat in August 19. That's focused on crowdfunding. Uh, it will be at 1 p.m. just like today. Uh, registration is open for that. So please visit, visit the link that I had posted on our website. Um, and uh, you will be receiving a short survey at the end of this uh, webinar, maybe by tomorrow. So let us know what you thought about our um, our panelists, our moderator, the, the event that we put together. Let us know if there's anything else that you want to hear from us. I know that we didn't get to go over all the questions that were, that were, that were asked today. Uh, reach out to us if there is something specific that you want to learn or if there's something that we can answer. We're happy to, happy to answer that questions offline. So with that, um, let me wrap it up. Um, thank you again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you to our, our partners today. And thank you for everyone who found time to attend this event this afternoon. Um, and with that, um, all right, everyone, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Have a healthy day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.